Welcome. Generous theology. This is Brock. I'm with my friend, Chuck, and we are happily proceeding through Herman Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics. Chuck, we're in volume one on prolegomena, and in the section, part four on Revelation, the principiums of the faith, and chapter 12, Revelation in Nature and Holy Scripture. And Chuck, I think the idea here is this, you know, we've talked in chapter 10 about general revelation, and then in chapter 11, we got into special revelation, but it's just as important, perhaps, Chuck, to not only spend time on those two topics as topics of their own, but it's worth spending time discussing how they link, how they relate to each other, and why it is that general revelation is vital if limited in its scope, in its impact, in its ability to interact with the fallen, sinful human mind, and then special revelation, how it is indeed special, but at the, at the very time that it's special and unique, it still has a foot in reality. And so we can't simply supernaturalize a special revelation apart from general revelation. It's God's universe, Chuck, and he is a part of it in all of these manifold dimensions. And so I think Professor Bavink gives us some very interesting aspects of how these two doctrines come together for the Christian, for the believer, and also some historical interactions and engagements with, with folks who have thought differently about how it all comes together, as well as just a, a discussion of our own tradition, what Reformed thinkers have thought. And so with this in mind, Chuck, that's, that's a high-level overview. This was a packed chapter, and we've got a lot of different sections to go through to do the professor justice here. Let me throw it over to you at a high level. When you're taking a look at the different essays here, and I think we're looking at eight or 10 different essay sections in this chapter, which is, that's on the high side. And there's a lot there going on that the professor's trying to communicate. What was happening to you when you were reading this chapter and you were trying to, to put it all together in a picture? Well, you're right that this really is a series of, of essays. You can almost picture each of the sections being perhaps a lecture or a portion of a lecture, you know, on a, on a particular class day. And, and so there is a sense in which you can really see that in, in, in this particular chapter. Uh, and, and obviously, there's, there, there's a lot of very interesting material here. You've got some of the historical material at the beginning. You've got some philosophical material towards the middle, you know, and, and actually as we get towards the end as well. But also, you know, some linguistic material or, you know, just thoughts about, you know, the, the purpose of language and, and how that plays in all of this. So there's, so there's also just so much depth in, in these particular, you know, short essays that make up this, this chapter, that this is one of those chapters where I think, uh, yeah, there's just so much that, that you can plumb the depths of. And in, in some areas, I, I would say, you know, at times, you know, it's, it's, it's slow going because, you know, I'm no expert in, in some of these matters. And, you know, you spend some time as you read through and, and look at what Bob Inc. is saying, perhaps doing a little bit of, you know, background, trying to build up that background knowledge. But there's also a sense in which, you know, there's so much, you know, one of the things that I do when, when I read, especially you know, this type of material, theology and philosophy, that kind of thing, is, you know, I, I read with a highlighter in my hand, and I'll, I'll highlight in, in different ways. And, and, and sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put some lines along the side, right? That's to point out some really important material, or I'll put a couple extra lines to show this is really important, or some brackets to show like, wow, this is a summary. And, and then, you know, fully highlighting certain very meaningful sections that, that just, you know, are, are really important. And, and what's interesting here is we've talked about this before, but the, the chapters in you know, this four-volume reform dogmatics begin with a short summary that is written by the editors that sort of summarize what's, what is to come. And, and I'll often, you know, as I, as I read through that summary, the first time through, I won't highlight, right? Because I'll be like, ah, I'll highlight that when I get to it in, in the material. But at times, then, what I'll do is I'll go back to that introduction, because the introduction so sums up pieces of what's going on, where Bavink is diving deeply 
And that introduction is, is such a good summary that I'll then go back and and make connections to some of the things that are in there. And this is one chapter where I've got all sorts of highlighting in that initial introductory paragraph, which is just an indication of, of how deep Bavink gets. And, and if I need to go back and, and connect with what was in that introductory material, just to make sure that I fully understood it. But but it's helpful then to have, you know, these these editors who, and obviously editors you know, are are looking at things through their own spectacles, but having editors who are helping us to look at what Bob Inc. is saying and, and tie it a little bit together. And especially since these were written as lectures, I think there is some some benefit to having editors who now tie this together a little bit and tie the chapters together a little bit. So yeah, this this is one of those chapters where, yeah, as I as I read through it, a lot of going back, a lot of a lot of diving into get background knowledge and a lot of tying it into that initial introductory paragraph. Were there, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, are there particular, and, and I know we've talked about a few things in here, but are there some particular sections, especially ones we, we haven't talked about yet, that really struck you as either either especially important or perhaps especially astute that where you just kind of like, wow, <laughs> he said that. Any thoughts? <laughs> Oh, Chuck, I'm so glad you asked. The answer is that when reading Bavink, wow, is a is a reaction I have very frequently. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if our listeners are old enough to remember, there was a Batman TV series, a live action TV series from the 1960s that starred Adam West as Batman. And of course, I was a I was a boy in in that era, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and watching those episodes was a lot of fun because whenever Batman and Robin would get into a fight, these cartoonish balloons would come up and, and uh, Batman would throw a punch and, and, and hit the villain. And this cartoon balloon would come up and it would say bath. And then he'd throw another one and it would go biff. And then another cartoon blow, blow would come up and go vroom. And, and it was just, those were spiced throughout the, the, the fight scenes. And it made it made that series so much fun, even if even if it made it a little bit less serious as an action piece. And reading Bavink, that happens to me a lot. Uh, I, I see these cartoon balloons filled with these amazing expressions of wow and zap and bang and going and for all these all these beautiful points that the professor makes. And one of the first things I'll get into the first section here. One of the first things that matters to me a lot is I think I think people use terms in a manner that sometimes we imagine is precise. But when we push on our usages and examine how how we talk and use such words, we find that it's quite squishy. For example, Chuck, I'll say the word barbecue and and people will know or think they know they have a really good idea. What's he talking about when he says barbecue? Okay, well, I know what barbecue is. It is, boom. And then out comes their, out comes their internal ideas. It's something like what happens to, to brisket, to pork, to chicken. But if you actually push and try to define what is barbecue and what isn't barbecue, you find that there are a lot of different ways that people use the same terms. And barbecue in a Texas style uh, context might means something completely different from barbecue in a Florida style or North Carolina style barbecue, which is a personal favorite of mine, is, is something that is different even yet. And of course, Chuck, I grew up north in the north and we had ideas about what barbecue was there. And, and whatever you can say about the north, it was the, the north's idea of barbecue is definitely different from what I've experienced in the south. And so too, these terms here, revelation, natural, and supernatural really are surprising, surprisingly squishy, not necessarily in bad ways, but I think in Professor Bobink's section here, we have to face we have to face the fact that our squishiness can can lead us to a lot of ambiguity if we're not careful. And so I appreciate Professor Bobink's essay on this topic. And and let me say why. And I'm gonna read a little bit from Professor Bovink here, he says this, while scripture may not make it explicit, it does recognize an ordinary order of nature, as well as the deed and work that are causally rooted in the omnipotence of God. 
And so there's this idea, Chuck, when we speak about natural and supernatural, I think as Christians, longtime Christians, you and I are informed with meaning for these words that's oftentimes not what the same meaning that our friends we are talking with use. For example, I have found that atheists really think of the words natural and supernatural quite often very difficult, different from from me. And so Professor Bovink here talks about this idea of nature, which, which I've taken as a given in most of my conversations. I speak about human nature. I speak about the nature of the universe. I speak about the, the, the reality of the way God has created and constructed and, and preserves and provides for his creation. And I use this idea that things, that objects have a nature. And, and Professor Bovink here talks about this idea of something natural in the context of a particular thing as being that which develops apart from any alien power or influence. And then he restates it solely in terms of its own internal forces and laws. And so there's this idea that objects in reality have a nature. Whatever else we can say about human beings, Chuck, there's no denying that we have a nature. We move and act in certain ways. We don't move and we don't act in other ways. And so because of that, when we speak about what it means for a human to be natural, what it means for a rock to be natural, what it means for reality to be acting in a natural way, we really have this idea of looking at an object free from alien power or influence, or put it another way, an object that's interacting in reality in terms of its own internal forces and laws. I really like that from Professor Bovink. And so when we talk about, for example, uh, does humankind have freedom of will? I think this is a great question. What is the human nature about the faculty of will that we possess? And this is where a lot of people get an intuitive idea. And there's this idea, well, my will, if it's free, means that it is free from any external influence, any alien power. I'm not a robot. Nobody is, quote unquote, pushing my buttons. I'm not a puppet on a string. And at the same point in time, one can, can talk about this idea of the freedom of the will, but then also say of that very same will that there are some internal forces and laws. For example, humankind in our nature, we have what the, what the ancients called passions, Chuck, and what they often meant by that, by saying passions, a human being is a passionate animal or an impassioned being, is that there are forces and laws that interact on us, but we don't typically consider them external or foreign or alien to us. So for example, Chuck, we were just talking a moment ago about barbecue, and I love to eat barbecue. And so there's just something in my nature that loves to eat and it's not, it's, it's barbecue in the, it's barbecue in the abstract, but it is also barbecue in the particular. And so I am moved, you know, my, my nutritional needs pull me into relating and as well as, you know, my need for electrolytes and vitamins and minerals and nutrients, they drive me. I seek out this thing we call barbecue. And on the one hand, I will talk about my will not being driven by an alien power and yet at the very same point in time, that doesn't exclude this idea that there are some forces and laws that are impressing themselves upon me. And, and that's why this fight for such an understanding of the term nature and natural has so much meaning. Now, another side aspect of this that's, that's so valuable, Chuck, is, is this idea that what are the limitations of, of the material, the physical nature that we have? And I don't just mean humans, although, of course, I mean us as humans, but just objects themselves. And, and, and the reason why I ask is this is a great point of contention in the discussions between believers and non-believers, especially atheists in this day. Very oftentimes, Christians will talk about reality being governed by a God, having a personal dimension to the way things work in reality. A personal being is overseeing every aspect of what's happening in reality, down to the, the Bible says the hairs on our head are numbered. The Bible says that 
we are worth many sparrows. The Bible speaks deterministically about us, and deterministically in the sense that there is a God, there is a purpose, a personal being who is behind everything, who is guiding things toward a predetermined or an ultimate end. Now, that contrasts very much with an idea that's very prevalent from my non-believing and atheist friends. And they will say that if there is purpose to be found in reality, and many of them are not sure that there is, but if there is purpose, it simply emanates. And that's, that's the key term here. It emanates from the nature of the physical material itself. And so they will be thinking things like, well, Brock, oxygen has an atomic number of eight. So that's just something that's not directed by God, but it just is. That's what it means to be an atom of oxygen, is to have this, this physical nature that emanates. And oxygen has a certain chemical affinity to other elements in the periodic table. It likes to combine with some elements in manner that's different from other elements. And, and Brock, they'll say, there's no God behind it. It is just simply the, the material substance doing what it does. It's following rules, yes. It's got some nature, yes. But these are internal forces and laws that are a property of of the physical nature itself. No God needed, no God required, no God to explain. And that's where my friends will often take that. And so when we think about this idea, nature and the supernatural, I think, I think we're really, think we're really over target for a very key point of discussion. And, and the way we define those words is going to affect the framing of the issue. Now, there's more involved in this section, Chuck, but I just wanted to throw that out there as something that I thought super important in this first essay, and then bounce that off of you and uh, for a reaction and, and maybe some other directions where you think the professor is taking things here. Yeah, no, I, I agree that this is really important material, and thinking about and defining these terms and the way we define these terms often sets the stage, right? And so by defining terms, oftentimes we're creating the terms upon which we want to discuss. And and Bobbing points that out, actually, in, in, in mentioning that, that there is still some, some concern about these definitions and how some of these definitions and distinctions between the natural and the supernatural need to be defended against a philosophy that denies or weakens the supernatural. And he mentions how in later theology and philosophy, and he's talking primarily about 19th century, although I think that there is some of that we start seeing already with 18th century deists. But there is this concern he has that the term supernatural has often been used in a very modified sense. And he talks about the super sensible, as Kant will talk about it, or the free, as Fichte talks about it, or even the unknown, as Spinoza and Wegscheider speak of it, the new or the original under Schleiermacher, or the religious, ethical, or spiritual, Sauce. And when he says that the problem there is that when you modify these these meanings, you you become, you, it leads to misunderstanding. And he says, you know, if, if we're going to use the term supernatural, but we're only going to mean this very limited term, you know, the super sensible or the ethical, maybe then we ought to avoid using those terms because it can and can lead to some confusion. And I and I think that's, you know, that's an important point. And, and frankly, in, in my own background, I, I remember a few things that 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 occurred and, and some points that teachers and professors and, and others would often make that I think made that point. It was pretty common, and and I think this is a fairly common thing for many Christians. You know, when when you'll ask people for uh, you know items of prayer, and and you know, are there things that you're especially thankful to God for? And people will often talk about seeing God in nature, and when they say that, they mean things like thunderstorms or floods or blizzards or or you know necessary rains that that come at the right time or freezes that that come at the right time for blossoming of certain crops and 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 those kinds of things or you know hiking in a wilderness area or walking along the lake shore those those are the kinds of things that people will often mention and over the years i had a number of teachers professors pastors others who would always point out that we see God in nature, 
not only in what we consider nature, you know, the this sort of natural, untouched by human hand nature, but that there is a sense that nature also exists in terms of humans' impact on it. And so there would often be the 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 point made that we can also see God in you know, in a place like Northwest Iowa, where I grew up, you'd see God in the, in the in the large uh, outbuildings. You know that that the 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 animals were were put in, or the big silos, or or in you know the genetics industry, which which really grew big in in Northwest Iowa when I was in college. Or you know, if you would go to a city, you'd see it in the skyscrapers, you'd see it in the in the design of of vehicles and and those kinds of things. And of course, my dad, being an engineer and and a professor of engineering at a at a Christian university that was you know that was important to him as well and he would often teach his his engineers that they're you know that, that they're you know by participating in the rules of nature and using the rules of nature that are God's rules that he's established that really what we as humans are are doing is participating in that and so he would often warn against for example a concern that sometimes that I think this definitely happens outside of Christianity, but even that some Christians start to begin to think that somehow those things that are untouched by humanity are automatically better. That wilderness, for example, is better than a developed city, which is interesting given that God tells us to develop the garden and tells us that, you know, at the end of all things, when, when Christ returns, we'll live in a city, you know, and, you know, it's, and those those kinds of things are, are important to remember. There's also a sense then where if we, not only if we limit nature to too small a thing, but we limit super, super nature, you know, those things that are supernatural to just a very small, limited number of things, we run into other problems as well. And I know that there's been, I'm trying to think of the, the writer, and I can't think of his name, oh, Francis Collins. Francis Collins is a Christian who was involved with um, the Human Genome Project, and he often talks about how too often we limit the supernatural to merely those things that we don't know. And if we don't understand it, well, that's that's God then, right? And he says, the problem is, is that as we learn more and as we as we follow through on on you know God's cultural mandate to to be fruitful and multiply and and to be involved in in the earth, there there are there grow to be more things that we have understanding of, and 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 if we think of the supernatural as being only those things that we don't understand, and as we begin to understand more and more things, there's a tendency to do what we've seen happen: is to limit God to either, first of all, as as was done by the deists, to limit God to just some dude who set things in motion and then sits back and doesn't worry about what's going on and is not intimately involved in everything in his creation, or even to deny that a God even exists anymore because there's so much that we can that we can explain, you know, through through our knowledge of 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 the systems that that God has put in place. And so again, there is this danger of limiting this definition of supernatural so that it it it's almost meaningless or that by those definitions we hook the books so to speak and and um you know try to prevent arguments that that deal with this concept of the supernatural of of god you know being an intimate part of his creation yeah i think these definitions are really important things and you know it was important that bavink dealt with them early on amen my friend amen there was a, a way in which Professor Bavink took this discussion in, in the second section on Roman Catholic supernaturalism, that where Professor Bavink emphasizes a certain view that, com- that develops within the doctrines of the Roman Catholics. And, and he says it this way. I'm going to read uh, from that part of the essay. He says, in Roman Catholicism, there is quantitative contrast between the two revelation and nature. Natural religion, he says, is essentially different from supernatural religion, and the two are conceptually wholly different, two totally distinct systems and orders. The order of grace is elevated high above the order of nature. The whole of existence, accordingly, is divided between a sacred and a profane area. The world is the unconsecrated, profane area 
where Satan and his unholy minions holds sway. But squarely within that unholy world, God planted his holy, infallible church and endowed it with great treasure of grace. All that passes from that world to the area of the church has to be consecrated and blessed. And so what an interesting dualism. And, and what, what tends to come out here in Professor Bobbing's view is this idea that the, there is this graduated scale, this ranking of creatures and virtues. There's, an hi- there's a hierarchy in a physical sense and in an ethical sense. And what has happened is the image, the image of God in humankind, in a narrow sense is lost. So that when we live in this part, this profane part of the world, the whole of human nature is mutilated, and human beings can no longer have a religion and ethos that answer to God's demand. Their religion and virtue, meaning the religion and virtue of profane humankind affected by sin, however beautiful it may seem, is tainted to its very root. And so there is this, there is this idea that there is a merely natural human, that is to say, person, who is without the image of God after the fall into sin. And I think the Latin phrase Bavink cites there is in puris naturalibus. And they describe it as people in this state may acquire a pure knowledge of God, may serve him and fear him, may stand in a normal sense, even as a good servant relationship to him, may practice natural virtues, may even have a natural love for God, and may achieve a certain state of happiness in this life and in the life to come. But it is it is works-based. Professor Bavink says this, if people fail to achieve this state, it's their own fault. They didn't employ their natural powers that were given to them correctly. And so what makes the transition to this higher qualitative state in the Roman Catholic thinking? Well, Professor Bavink will, will say this, it is God's will, however, to give human beings a higher supernatural and heavenly destiny. To this end, he furnishes them super added gifts. That is to say, he grants supernatural grace by which they can know and love God in a higher and better way, where they can practice better and higher virtues and and attain a higher destiny. And so here, Professor Bavink talks about faith and charity as being the cornerstones of this higher knowledge. And when this grant occurs, then this higher destiny consists in being children of God, birthed from above, in a mystical union with God, participating in his divine nature, participating in his deification, participating in a vision of God. And so, with that in mind, Chuck, we're going to talk about where the Reformers went with this, but what an interesting way to lay this out. Now, Chuck, you and I both know that it's, it's, it's a high mark for a theologian to represent another view, not his own, with a degree of faithfulness, with a degree of charity, generosity, in, in its noblest and best sense, perhaps. And, and I think that's what Professor Bavink has done here, speaking about these Roman Catholic conceptions. And I, that's very rare. I think it's very difficult to find people in our tradition, Reformed tradition, speaking about Roman Catholicism in such a way that that many Roman Catholics would say, yeah, that's that's a fair treatment of what we believe. And so I've valued that part of it here. Chuck, what what impact did it make on you? And and that's going to bleed over into where the Reformation is going to take and and push in its own directions, too, isn't it? It is. And just as in the previous section, thinking through this and reading through this reminded me of some things from from my upbringing, this this section does as well. Certainly, this idea of the nature-grace dichotomy that, you know, is a part of Roman Catholic thought, but is also realistically... I think we find it in a lot of other a lot of other Christian thinking, not just Roman Catholicism, is is something that, as I was growing up, was something that was really pressed against to the point where I recall the church. So the church I grew up in, from when I moved to Iowa until graduated from college and, and left, when when we first moved 
to Iowa, the church that we attended met in a school. And we would just go into the gym, and before the service, they would set up chairs in the gymnasium, and we'd have church in there. And then after church, what often would happen is the the kids would go off to Sunday school, and the adults would hang around and put the chairs away. And and often it seemed time just so that it would get done just as we were done with Sunday school. And that was sort of a, a period of time of, you know, a fellowship as you were slowly putting away those those chairs, right? Not working too hard at it because, you know, you didn't want to get done long before the kids were done with Sunday school. And it was something that people that the church had that had been around for a few years when we when we joined when we moved there i think it had been around 5 6 years and and so when at some point the decision was made to buy the the building that was being left by the old first christian reformed church as they were moving into a a new building there were some important decisions that were that needed to be made first of all whether to do it there were those who were opposed to the idea of having a separate church building, because there was some thought that sometimes people tend to treat church buildings as somehow holy in a way that the rest of the world isn't, you know, that nature-grace dichotomy. There was also a decision made that they would never use the word sanctuary. And, and now that might sound a little strange to people, but think of about how that word sanctuary, where, where it comes from, right? The, that first part, that sanct part is is about holy, right? And it's it's and being set apart, and that somehow the sanctuary is more holy than other parts of the church. And and that comes from, you know, Roman Catholic theology where you would walk in when you walk into the sanctuary, you you have holy water, and, and and there are certain other rituals, and and so there was this deep desire that the the area that most people call the sanctuary that was just going to be the worship hall, and and in some ways that seems a little silly, but it but I think it reflects a little bit of uh, people f- figuring words matter, right? And and if we're going to avoid the creeping nature grace dichotomy, you know, then then we need to make sure that our language uh, reflects that. I think Francis Schaeffer, Schaeffer is a well-known Christian author, and and he spends a lot of time dealing with this issue and and why it's important that this nature grace dichotomy, first of all, be identified in the philosophy of not only Roman Catholics, but of many Protestants as well, and and why we need to strive against that idea. He says, you know, the, the problem is that then we start thinking of these two areas as being autonomous, as being entirely separate from each other. And then when that happens, nature tends to eat up grace. And, 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 and in fact, that's what's happened. And Schaefer kind of goes through that in some of his books of, of how in, in the last Last, you know, couple of centuries, nature has eaten up grace, and we no longer have the supernatural. We no longer have the grace because of this dichotomy between the two of them. And in a, in a more reformed view, we need to revolt against this idea, as, as Bavink puts it, of a, a an antithesis between nature and grace as being so totally opposed that leads to you know these sort of strange ideas. I think we see. You know, frankly, even things like celibate priesthood and things like that are, you know, come from this idea of the natural world being in some ways less important or less pure than the supernatural world. And and then that leads to then people thinking that certain certain jobs, certain professions become more important than others. Martin Luther certainly fought against that as well. He often talked about how a Christian shoemaker, I think it was a shoemaker that he, you know, ought to, you know, he ought to be a Christian as he makes his shoes. And, and that means making the best quality shoes that he possibly could make and, and having pride in the quality of the work that he does. And and so there are some real important things that, that come out of fighting against that nature-grace dichotomy. And it's true that that it, it, that nature grace dichotomy comes it tends to sneak right back in it's yeah it's it's it on the one hand we can say well that's a catholic view but but that nature grace dichotomy often does sneak in in many other ways and and we can't just say well that's a a catholic view because oftentimes we see it even in the way that we behave and even in the way that we think about things it's chuck i'm reminded of Several different movies I have watched over the years that have built upon this fundamental understanding, this dichotomy 
in interesting ways. I've seen many movies where they were action movies, and so there's violence, there's killing, there's death, there's warfare between powers of good and evil. But if you've ever seen this in the movies where combatants can meet uh, in a church, and it's usually a cathedral, it's usually this nice dark corner of this, of this Roman Catholic church, and good and evil can come in, and there's this tacit, implicit idea that this is quote-unquote holy ground. And because of that, well, we can't fight. We can't fight in the church. And that's an interesting way that this dualistic concept can play out. Now, Chuck, not that I'm advising you or I to get into the life of an action hero dueling against evil, and then evil one day wants to, to talk and we'll say, okay, well, let's, let's meet at the church down the street. You know, because from what we understand in our, in our own reformational view, there's nothing special about the ground itself. In the Roman Catholic idea, it's ground can be sacramentally blessed, water can be sacramentally blessed, objects can be put aside sacramentally. And Chuck, we can, we can also, as Protestants, do such things. We can set aside things for special purposes. But I think the idea is we shouldn't think that the setting aside of something actually puts it from one kingdom into another. And so, in other words, you know, if something happens in real life and I'm fighting crime and, and the crime boss says to me, OK, Batman, let's meet on neutral ground. I'll meet you down at the church. I don't think there's anything particularly special there. Even, even if the, the ground itself has been blessed, I, I think that if I, I went there, the fight could just as easily happen there as it could happen anywhere else. And I think that's, Professor Bobbink says, that's what the Reformation wanted. He says it this way, Christianity that was not hostile to nature, but only to the sins present in nature. And Professor Bobbink says this, there's this old ad nature commends grace. Grace amen nature. And there's a beautiful passage Professor Bobbing cites, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and it says this, only let each per person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Now here's the sentence. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bond servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bond servant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. And Chuck, I think we have this idea that to think of this dualistic situation between the sacred and the profane in an absolute qualitative and quantitative way is, is a bridge too far for us. God has not simply revealed a part of the world. God has not simply redeemed a part of the world system. He has redeemed the world system. Now, it's coming in various times, in various places, you and I, Chuck, are redeemed earlier than others who will be redeemed later. And yet, ultimately, this entire world system, the universe, reality, where we live, it will one day all be moved from its situation. The transition will occur, and we shall be physical beings again in a glorified state, living in this new heavens, this new earth, this new Jerusalem. And, and so with that in mind, we see that language serves these ends and these purposes. And so I was really excited by that. I think Professor Bobbink really blessed us with those. Let me throw it over to you to, to, to build upon that or, or make some other comments in this direction. What, what do you think, how did it take it for you? Yeah, I just, I, I wanted to mention too that, that there are some really important, I think, practical results of 
Bavink's discussion here about natural, supernatural, and, and the idea that we don't necessarily have this strict dichotomy between them and that we don't denigrate the natural to, you know, to the exclusion of it as opposed to the supernatural or to the to that of grace. You know, Bavink here makes the point that what the Reformation wanted was a Christianity that was hostile not to nature, but only to sin. And I, I think that's that, that's just a a wonderful statement. You know, we're, we're as Christians, we're not hostile to nature. We're not hostile to who we are as humans, to, to human nature. We're hostile to sin, and we're hostile to how sin has impacted nature. And so there's some, you know, I'll just mention a couple of things that I've read in the last few years that I think build on that concept. You know, they're, they don't, they're not specific to things that Bavink says here, but they build on things that Bavink has said. And in fact, I'm aware that both authors I'm going to cite have read some of, of Bavink. And so one is, I think there's an excellent book on work entitled Every Good Endeavor, Connecting Your Work to God's Work by Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller. And, the, you know, that that what he does in that book is points out that our work is not simply part of a nature that we should despise, that we should, you know, look to avoid or look to get out of, that, you know, that when we get to heaven, we can avoid working. That's, that's not the case at all. But rather, our work, in many ways, is is holy because it's a part of God's plan for us. And we ought to think of our work as the means by which God loves his people and cares for his world through us. It is through human work, from the simplest farm girl milking the cows to the truck driver bringing produce to the market to the local grocer. God could feed us directly, but he chooses to do it through work. And so that means even the most menial tasks have great dignity. Work is important. We're God's hands and fingers in the work. We are doing God's work of sustaining and caring for God's world. It also means that one of the ways that we please God, and one of the most important ways, actually, that, that we please God is by doing our, our work well. That's I, I think I referenced Luther there as well, and, and Keller, I know, in his book talks a lot about what Luther says uh, about that. And then it also means that we need to have a great and deep appreciation for for the work of others who work skillfully. And that includes people who don't necessarily share our beliefs. We're going to be working in sort of the, the world with, with folks like that. The other book, and there's just a single devotional or a single section in this book that I also think really built on that, although I think her book does in, in other ways as well, Tish Harrison Warren wrote a book called Prayer in the Night, and it's she's an Anglican priest, and it's her book is a reflection on Compline, which is the, the evening prayer tradition in of, of the Anglican Church. And she goes through some of the prayers in the Anglican tradition and, and reflects on them. And, and she also wrote a section in her book, Prayer in the Night. It was specifically about those who work in the night. And when prayers like that were written, most people didn't work at night. And the type of work that was done was often more dangerous. It was the work of protecting the community and, and, and that kind of thing. And and she points out that, you know, it's important for us as Christians to remember people who do that kind of work, work that isn't always, you know, isn't always glamorous. You know, it may be the work of the, the police officer who is fighting crime, the work of a social worker who's dealing with people with mental illness, or even, you know, the work of a, a parent, you know, responding to a crying child, a sick child of the night and cleaning up after them. You know, those are all part of God's plan for us. Sickness isn't, but but the care that we have for, for children, the mental illness is, but the care for the people that we have. Crime isn't, but the care that we have for the community that we're protecting, that that is, that, that is clearly a part of, of our human nature and therefore something that God blesses. And those were just a couple of things that, that I wanted to mention as we discussed this section on, on the Reformed Reformational view about, you know, this idea of of, of the unity, or at least the lack of a dichotomy, lack of an antithesis between nature and grace. Obviously, there are some issues we'll, we, we, we'll, we'll get into, I'm sure, at some point about 
you know, what are the two kingdoms and what does that mean and, and, and those kinds of things. But certainly I think this section also plays somewhat on that by telling us a little bit about what it is. And it's not about just simply a, a, a world, a kingdom of the natural, which we look to escape and a kingdom of heaven that we look to go to, but rather it's it's much more than that, that the, that the nat- natural and the supernatural, just as they exist today, will continue to exist exist in the new heavens and the new earth and work as you know it it won't be affected by sin as it is today but our work will continue because it has dignity it is part of who we are it is part of our nature as humans and that's a good thing uh, that that's how god created us to do work and we'll continue to do that in the new heavens and the new earth we're not just going to be sitting up on clouds playing playing harps maybe maybe really good harpists will be but but most of us you know that's not what we're going to be doing um that's just an extension that i wanted to add on to some of the discussions that that we're having any follow up on that or anything you want to deal with but as as we wrap up tonight no, I think I think I think this is a great pause point for us. We, we've had a chance to really look at the first three essays in this chapter twelve, and the the change of gears <laughs> that for the next section I think warrants us to to pause here. But but just to say this, Chuck, there are one one of the things that I'm most concerned with is language usage. There are ways of there are inherent ambiguity in language. Often, we talked earlier in this discussion episode about barbecue. And Chuck, it's possible that I could be talking with you about barbecue, and you could get the wrong idea. I could have in mind some particular form or style of barbecue. And I'm talking about it, and I'm making sense of how that style of barbecue tastes, how it's made, what foods it pairs well with, but if I just say barbecue and I don't get into the details of what I mean by that, and, and, and you're thinking that I'm referring to another style of barbecue, well, guess what? <laughs> Hilarity, misunderstanding, and ambiguity can abound. And I think that's what happens a lot in our discussions, both with other Christians as well as outside when, when believers talk with, with non-believers. Now, some degree of this is is simply part of life. Reality is just way too complicated to for us to use <laughs> different and unique terms for everything without ambiguity and without the potential for misunderstanding. But at the same point in time, it's worth talking about how very often partisans can willfully misunderstand each other. And Chuck, perhaps you're talking to me about barbecue, and, and if I have a grudge towards you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen and hear what you're saying with with an ambiguity in mind that might be plausible, but but no person who who invests in good faith responses is going to think that, that something wholesome is happening there. And I was I was reminded, and I'm 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 pulling it up here as we as we speak. I w- I was reminded of this trope called explain a film plot badly. Explain a film plot badly, and. The idea is, is how can someone humorously summarize something in a way that's technically accurate and yet at the same point in time really miss the point? And so one of my favorite uh, memes is somebody explained the Lord of the Rings trilogy, three films, Chuck. And somebody said, you know, how can you explain the Lord of the Rings badly in, in, in a very short, pithy way? And so somebody summarized and said, Lord of the Rings, a tale of a group that spends nine hours returning jewelry. And that was, that was humorous. And that was fun. And uh, Chuck, that nine hours returning jewelry. <laughs> what a way to, to say it without saying it and to explain it, but in a way that actually takes advantage of that ambiguity for, in this case, humorous reasons, but it could be it might not be. It, for example, here's another one. Explain a film plot badly. So somebody said, okay, explain Avatar badly. And somebody wrote uh, Pocahontas with blue people. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's meant to be humorous, <laughs> but it's, of course, not meant to be taken seriously. Now, somebody else said, how do you explain a film plot badly for Beauty and the Beast? And somebody wrote this one 
sentence summary. Young girl with mental illness talks to furniture and marries her kidnapper. <laughs> and so, Chuck, with that in mind, theology is very often filled with willful ambiguity, willful misunderstanding. And some of it's for humorous intent. Like I consider all of these explain a film plot badly memes to be ultimately meant to inspire humor. But Chuck, you know, we really need to go through the way we use our terms and try to talk about them, not necessarily to eliminate all ambiguity, because I, I think that's a losing battle. And first of all, I don't think it's even possible in the rich world we live in. But, but this idea of communicating as best we can, so that hopefully, perhaps, people will not misconstrue what we're saying. People will not misunderstand our points and the theology that we're trying to talk about. And so I think we're going to have more of that coming up with respect to this link between revelation in nature and special revelation. So I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. And I, I can't wait for next time.